Because people are doing what they're doing because they think it's the right thing. Yes. If we're trying to influence them, we've got to understand that they're in this information fire hose and we're trying to navigate information in there and we're also got this setback where we're actually asking them to do something that's a completely different belief system that do behaviors that are aligned with the belief system that they probably don't already have so Welcome to episode 19 of the Marketing Your Practice podcast with the Tony and Angus here from Adio Media. Today we had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Martin Harvey, who is a communication expert in the field of chiropractic and natural health uh, as well. And we dived into some amazing things with Martin. Um, yeah. Martin's been in practice for over 25 years, uh, studied the influence literature like no one else really and has some amazing unique abilities. Uh, what were some of your takeaways? I think this Martin's whole concept in uh, you know people do what they do because what they believe in essence. So this concept of why our patients would think, hang on, I told them to do this and why they didn't follow through with it. If you don't have strategies really to identify their belief systems, and Martin kind of has this uh, uh, this hierarchy of beliefs or a continuum of beliefs that he kind of identifies there as well. I love the way that he just took us through strategies of helping people move along from focus on symptoms, their focus on prevention, their focus all the way through to performance as well. He also did a really beautiful job of articulating the difference between influence and manipulation mm. as, as well. So if you're wanting to improve your retention, um, when we look at our practice multiplier number six, which is all about building lifetime relationships, if you're wanting to build longer relationships, if you're wanting to improve your communication, then you're going to love this episode with uh, Martin Harvey. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Let's kick on over and listen to what Martin has to say. Martin Harvey, welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Great to see you. Great to see you guys too. Thanks for having me. Look, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on as always, mate. Uh, now, over the past you know, many years, 10 years even, you've really positioned yourself in the chiropractic profession and natural health care as a communications expert, uh, what we like to think of as the communication master. How did that journey, where did communication become important? Where did it all start for you and how did it get you to where you are now? Okay, so it, it actually even goes back a little bit longer than 10 years, so I appreciate you making me seem younger than I am, but. Um, <laughs> For me, I got into chiropractic and in the latter years of my university training, I was one of those people who, who kind of got the big idea all of a sudden. So I went from probably being like a lot of people at uni where you're sort of pretty a big priority around social life and what your profession was going to give you. Like I'd get to surf more and I'd get to have cool stuff and cars and holidays and whatever else. And then uh, in the latter stages of, my, of being at university, I started to be exposed to people like Reggie Gold and other people like that who were talking at this kind of bigger picture of what impacting people's health could do for their life. That once you got people to live a healthier, happier, more active life through, in our case, chiropractic or equally other people in other areas of natural health can have the same impact that it wasn't just this sort of isolated, you had less headaches or less back pain, your whole life changed when your body worked better. And I found that super inspiring. And it was also really kind of packaged in this idea of the, the world was broken and the healthcare was broken and what people were doing was living these lives that were way less than they could be. Uh, and we needed to go out there and kind of spread this message of uh, excitement and transformation through chiropractic care and I was super engaged with that it sort of changed my whole focus around what I wanted to do with my life and whether it was more about serving other people than necessarily serving myself having said that the communication style that was pretty popular at that, that time uh, was pretty much telling the story like telling people why they were wrong for taking medication telling people why they were wrong for not having chiropractic care when they didn't have symptoms kind of all this telling people stuff and making people wrong 
and it was sort of like your mission to ram your message down people's throat whether they wanted to hear it or not. So I had this, on one hand, I think of it as a really positive intent, but I had really not great skills at all because my main tool was just trying to ram a message down people's throat and ramming anything down people's throat tends not to be something that they particularly enjoy. So I look at that as my chiropractic asshole years. Like I was just... <laughs> It, it, I wanted to be, have chiropractic and almost convince them against their will that it was something that they needed to have. And I just did that, but I sort of got a bit worn down by it. And it didn't take all that long for me to be worn down. So probably a year or two into practice, I just had one of those moments of clarity of going, surely there's got to be a better way. There's got to be people in other industries, in other realms who are trying to impact people, trying to help them make better quality decisions that will help their lives, but are not going around being assholes about it like I was. So uh, I happened across, just in, at more or less the same time, I happened across a book in the local bookshop, um, which was Cialdini's um, influence book, that, which is kind of, like, I think, a pretty seminal book in what I think of as the influence literature and from there I just sort of dove deeper and deeper and deeper and then looked to well how can I apply these ideas from outside chiropractic to help chiropractors and more broadly natural health have more of an impact. It's um, an interesting story I was uh, you know Melbourne CBD opposite Flinders Street recently waiting at the lights to cross and there was a guy positioning himself on a box there with a bible and he was really <laughs> belting it out. Yeah. And full of it wasn't me. No, there, there's a couple of things that were that really struck me. One, the passion of this guy, which I really admired. But you know, the two, I kind of looked at the effectiveness of him. I mean, he was not a welcome guest. He was an unwanted pest. So I'm like, you know, on one hand, I see, you know, I listened to your experience you're talking about before. That is, you know, there are a group of people that I want to impact, a community, a world, those kind of things there too. But if, if we have passion, but we have really lousy strategy, then often that's what gets in the way. And I kind of, you know, I listen to and I can relate to that idea of being broken down and exhausted. And then what's really, I really admire about you is that often the conclusion from that is, is, oh, the world is broken. They don't even know what they're missing. And so we blame them as opposed to going, is there a different strategy? Is there another way that I need to kind of communicate to them? And thankfully for all of us, that was a process that you continue to dive into and you know, I know practitioners certainly around the globe that that use your frameworks with wonderful results as well. So let's start a little deeper. Like, what did you, you so you looked at Cialdini's book? What did you start to discover that was different with a model that you had before your asshole years that went into what was the transition that the, the bigger has? So the bigger has, so the Cialdini was sort of a leaping off point. There's a heap of other literature in the influence literature. But if, if we look at what is the influence literature, it, it started off in psychology. So Cialdini is a psychologist. But then there's a lot of other professions that have also joined in. So there's behavioral economics, marketing. Um, there's also a whole lot of neuroscientists who work in this area. And what, make, what they're all interested in is why do people do what they do? And what can we do to influence them? And so there's a, a couple of critical observations that I had to come to to realise that telling people was never going to work. And the first of them is more or less the first principle of uh, uh, the influence literature is people do what they do because they believe what they believe. So if we are looking at a, a scenario like the natural health scenario where our beliefs that drive our behavior so we often think of behavior change we're going to say something to somebody to change their behavior you don't actually you can't change behavior at a at that level you've got to go deeper and change beliefs so that behavior is almost automatic so if somebody's taking um, three Panadol a day because they're getting headaches every day they're doing that because they think that that's the right thing to do based on their existing belief system. So if I double click on that, first thing that I think I, I, was, I came to was these people are doing these things because they actually believe that's the right thing to do. So what do I have to do to be able to change beliefs? And there's two more sort of concepts that I think are critical for people and were critical for me to kind of understand to work out a better strategy. And the first is that when we're communicating with people, 
the environment that we're communicating now is very different from the environment as it was in the 50s, 60s, wherever, in terms of there's been an information revolution in that period of time. So the strategies that perhaps used to work of doctor knows best and you just tell people or people are searching for information about a health issue and if you just tell them a solution, they're going to be really curious and engaged. Like I'm old enough to remember that if you were looking for information, you'd have to go to the library to, to get an encyclopedia to look it up. Mm. And that could be 20 years ago, but that was the most current information you had access to. Or like even trying to access information, you know, those microfiche machines oh, that you had <laughs> look the, the binoculars. I mean, it's insane when you think about it now. Yeah. But now most of the people that we're communicating to have all of human knowledge to this point accessible through a little device in their pockets. So there's a very different information environment. And so the the majority of the information that people get, they block or filter because they're, it's not that they're out there seeking information, they're deluged with information. So very different information environment and just telling people the default position for people is to block or filter or ignore incoming signals because there's too much. Just you think of your own life. And, and it's estimated the average person has around about 3,000 marketing messages a day. So unless it's specific, unless there's a couple of little tags on it that mean, oh, this is important for me, default is that we ignore it. So that was another realisation that we needed to have. Coupled with that difference in belief system, um, if you have information that that comes to you or is, is somebody's trying to interrupt you with a message and it's the opposite or it doesn't already align with your beliefs, we have a natural tendency to block it or even more so actually have uh, evoke what's called confirmation bias, which is where if somebody if we feel like we're being made wrong for a belief that we have or a behavior that we have because that's a reflection of belief, will tend to actually push back and think of all the reasons the other person's wrong or we're in fact right. So your dude on the, if you weren't already evangelically Christian, yeah. your guy trying to evangelize you outside the railway station and interrupt you going for your nice dinner out, you kind of mentally, even without sort of consciously do it, doing it, there's a tendency to sort of go, I'm going to screw you, buddy. I've got my life right. You were the guys who are molesting all the kids. You know, all the... Not all of them, just most of them. <laughs> yeah. All those on boxes outside train stations. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that we have that element. Uh, if we kind of go back through that sequence, people are doing what they're doing because they think it's the right thing. Yes. If we're trying to influence them, we've got to understand that they're in this information fire hose and we're trying to navigate information in there. And we're also got this setback where we're actually asking them to do something that's a completely different belief system, that do behaviors that are aligned with the belief system that they probably don't already have. Yeah. So telling people stuff, ramming information down their throat does not work. But even worse than that, if it evokes confirmation bias, you're actually having them neurologically reinforce the existing belief system because they're a lot of people inherit mm -hmm. this belief system. Most people haven't sort of sat down with a pen and piece of paper and go, what do I believe about health? They've just absorbed it through the culture, through their parents, through all these influences around them. And so then we actually go, you know, that belief system, you're kind of dumb for having it. You should have this belief system. They push back against it and go actively, cognitively, searching for the reasons that they're right so they reinforce they neuroplastically embed an existing belief system so the the thing that i i guess i have regret about in that whole journey is not so much where i've ended up because i feel like this is what natural health practitioners need is this communication skills set but part the part of that journey along the way i feel like there are a lot of people who are actually more or less reinforced their um their, uh, I guess, sort of more symptomatic outside in belief systems around health by making them wrong for the behaviours that they were having. When you, when you think about it too, because th that idea of 
you know, certainly us as under this umbrella as natural health practitioners, which we said, look, the body's self-healing, let's be conservative, let's be naturalistic in our approach. The vast majority of the world has a different belief system than that. Yeah. So most people are coming in with that. So the idea of, you know, I know for me there were times when I just thought it was so simple of, oh, you've got this going on, so stop doing that, stop doing that, stop doing that, that's wrong, start doing this now, uh, and all will be okay. And you, yeah. you're, you're right um, uh, as well. I, I want to go back a little bit too because I know that this was a, a, something I had to kind of progress through there too. And I just want to make sure that our, our audience kind of gets their head around because this word influence pops up often. Yeah. And in the early days for me too, I actually kind of had a negative connotation in around it there yeah. too. So when you talk about influence, is do you differentiate between things like influence and manipulation? And where does that yeah. come in in terms of us taking advantage of people? So when you're saying, look, I want to influence my patients, I want to get them to do it, but where yeah. does, can we just put a, a caveat over the top of that as well? Okay. So another word that in some ways I think is perhaps more useful is that you're creating leadership skills. Now, the reason that we don't use that is that that's probably got a broader context than what we're talking about. Mm. If we go back into manipulation is not a great strategy because mm. no, I, I like the saying, people do love to buy. People like to do things like, you know, I love to reward myself and you know buy something shiny and new that excites me. Nobody likes to be sold because it's an element of having our free will to make our own decisions that are best for us. And having that free will gives us a strong sense of self-efficacy. And so if you impinge on people's ability, their autonomy, their ability to, uh, their sense of self-efficacy, that's going to backfire on you. There's a, a concept that they talk about in the literature called reactance, which is if you overstep and feel and people feel that their autonomy in making a decision is being uh, impinged upon, they'll actually, even if they think that what you're suggesting that they do, they can clearly see logically, emotionally, it's the right thing to do. That sense of having their autonomy impinged upon, they'll actually do the reverse. So it's called the boomerang effect or reactance. You'll do the opposite. So Influence isn't the same as manipulation, mm. but I understand how people confuse them. Influence is the the ethical approach of presenting information in a way so that people can make better decisions that serve them. Yeah. So it's not about doing something to serve you. It's about giving information to people in a way that they can get around their cognitive biases in a better way. Yeah, I like that definition. I when I think about, and Tony and I often talk about it as well, this idea of, you know, manipulation is something that inherently serves me more than it serves you. You know, influence is something that serves you. Now, it might serve me at the same time if I'm selling a product, but it might not as well. And so, you know, I think when our, if our audience are listening, now, can you use, and will we be able to use lots of the things that Martin is talking about to manipulate people? Then the short answer is absolutely yes. So there needs to be a, you know, a level of integrity and stuff that goes along with that. But I just wanted to, and I think you've sort of put that so eloquently there too, to have our audience know that we're talking about influence and ideally what I'm hoping the platform you're leaping off there is an outcome that not only serves you as, as a practice owner and you deserve to be kind of rewarded for your great work, but ultimately it's giving an outcome that's for the best of your practice members as you move forward as well. So, yeah. Could I just re-emphasize a couple of things there? Because I think it is a really important distinction to make. The first one is if you've got people who have had 3,000 marketing messages a day for years and years and years and years, they are incredibly sophisticated at uh, seeing when somebody is trying to manipulate them. Yeah. So even your own self-interest is served by never manipulating because it doesn't work. People have incredible bullshit meters to go, this guy is trying to run a game on me. Mm -hmm. The second thing that's sort of coupled with that is that um, people, we, we've moved from an era of sort of buyer beware to an era of vendor beware or, or provider beware because if you piss somebody off, and one of the best ways to piss somebody off is to evoke reactance, it, 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 the boomerang effect is they are pissed off that you were trying to manipulate them. They have all the cards on their side because they can very easily do a, a negative Google review, a negative Yelp review, a negative white coat review, a negative comment on Facebook. 
you have no ability to be able to then manage that. I mean, you, sorry, there are things you can do, but that's just not a good place to be in. So you, the, every incentive is to definitely serve their interests first because that's not only the ethical thing to do, but it's actually the most pr profitable thing to do. Yeah. There's thousands of people out there who need what you do. Just present it as an option to them using some of the skills that we're going to talk about hopefully in a second and as a better way of presenting information in, in a way that it's just easier for people to digest. So rather than telling people, there's a hierarchy of influence which is both uh, more impactful but also more respectful of people's, uh, I think, right to make their own decisions and process information for themselves rather than you kind of paternalistically deciding what's best for them. Absolutely. So let's get let's get into some some strategies, some tactics, Martin, on yep. going from that base of you know people do what they do because they believe what they believe. How do we go about uh, first of all, I guess, finding out what they do believe and then yep. trying to trying to change that, trying to influence that, or, or have them come up with uh, new, yep. new strategies for themselves. So, in terms of influence strategies, we we talk about a hierarchy of influence in terms of the things that are most likely to change people's beliefs and therefore their behaviour. Uh, and at the lowest level of that hierarchy is uh, things that are where you tell somebody information. Now, there are some circumstances where you do have to tell somebody stuff. So the first strategy that I tell people is if you are, if it's a circumstance that you just have to tell people this is what you should do, that you recognise that particularly in an environment where they're likely to have different belief systems, and I can loop back around and talk about how you tell what somebody's belief systems are in a minute, but the first strategy that I would suggest that people get used to using is permission. So let's say you're working with somebody who you're more of a, you're a, a vitalistic chiropractor or you're another natural health practitioner where you're wanting people to do something and almost one of the core beliefs that our culture has is like a, that you should only do things when you have symptoms and you're suggesting, look, yeah, once things are under control, actually doing these things on an ongoing basis is important in terms of prevention or performance or whatever objective you're aiming towards. Recognising that there's that kind of clash of beliefs that in some ways you might be making them wrong, critical thing is to ask permission beforehand. So let's say in that scenario, I'm mapping out a program of care for somebody. I would just ask permission first. So I'd say, look, Tony, would it be okay if I mapped out what I'd suggest we do for you once these symptoms are under control? Now, what that permission does is a couple of things. First of all, it communicates that I'm sensitive to the fact that it's his decision. It's his right to say yes or no. And as soon as you do that, you get reactants off the table because the natural antidote to be people feeling like somebody's trying to impinge on their autonomy is that you explicitly tell them, completely up to you. you it's your decision, yeah? The second thing that it does, provided I have one more step to it, is it drops the blocking and filtering. And the most critical step that I have to wait for is I have to wait for you to say yes. So if I say, if I say look, Tony, would it be okay if I explained why you need to keep having care after you're feeling good again and then I just roll into all the reasons for it? I haven't actually done anything because you what actually triggers that sense of, oh, actually, I asked for this, so I'm happy to come in even if it makes me feel like I'm a little bit wrong for what I've done previously. Um, you have to wait for the yes. In a dating yep. analogy, that would be called rape. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> In that, yeah, it's sort of like a little micro rate. <laughs> yeah, let's not let's not do that. So, folks listening, listen up. Get yeah. permission. So then, if we look then at that idea of well, how do I know what somebody's uh, levels of health belief is relative to mine? I think of health beliefs as sort of existing along a continuum. So, Angus was talking earlier about. Within chiropractic, we tend to have these ideas that the body's self-healing, self-regulating, self-developing, nervous system's the master control system, uh, that therefore chiropractic care by changing or uh, improving nervous system function has this whole body implication and implications as far as healing, regulation and uh, development. We, they're very alien, like most people are 
think that the, the way that you should you can tell whether you're healthy or not is by how you feel. Um, whereas we're having this idea that you can't really tell at all how healthy you are by how you feel. That you could feel great but have cancer starting, or you could be feeling sick because you've taken in some toxin, and the healthy response is to feel nauseated. So I look at people as existing along a continuum, and they've got different sorts of values with each of them. I look at the, a lot of our society, probably the majority of people, when they're first coming in to see a natural health care practitioner, are at what we would think of as a symptomatic level of health awareness, where for them, everything is about how you feel. You can, For most of those people, if you ask them how healthy are you, are you the biggest thing that they're thinking about is well, how they've been feeling or how they're feeling at that very moment. And so the behaviour that aligns with that belief is you tend to go and see a healthcare practitioner when you feel unwell and then you stop as soon as you're feeling well or you stop as soon as you've lost hope that you're going to feel well using this approach because it's a very rapid relief-oriented sort of system of beliefs. And so they're people that say in a chiropractic context, they don't hang around for very long. Um, and they sort of see that your job is to decode their symptoms and push the right button or do the right thing to make those symptoms go away. Mm. And they're going to tend to be people who have in and out, in and out, and then get progressively crappier health over the, the period of their life. Um, unless they have something happen that helps them sort of bridge up a level to what I would think of as a functional level of health awareness. And if the symptomatic people are all about pain, then for these people, it's more about prevention. So they kind of recognise that below the surface of things, something first of all had to not work properly for them to um, develop a symptom in the first place, that most of the time it doesn't happen at that moment that there's been a gradual breakdown. Now, in terms of delineating between the two, people are at a symptomatic level of health awareness often have that reactive behaviour in other areas of their life. So they're not going to look super healthy often. They're often overweight. They're often they're more likely to be smokers. They're more likely to just not look after things generally. Um, but they're also going to be people where as you're working with them, let's say it's in a chiropractic context and they're going through a phase of care, they're not actually that interested in what your testing results tell you. It's almost like the only thing that's really meaningful here is the, the symptoms that they have. So the classic thing in a chiropractic... But it's here. It's here, Doc. Yeah. So the, they have the classic things that drive chiropractors insane where every time they come in, they'll go, so the pain that was here, it's shifted a little bit. So it's calmed down here. Now, this bit's a little bit better, but this bit's better. So, mm. Or they'll get up after an adjustment and do that. Yeah, no, I don't think you got it. Like the, the symptoms and... If we look at it very charitably from the perspective of their belief systems, and we know that that behaviour comes from a belief system, if you had a belief system that health was all about how you feel, mm -hmm. that's a completely rational behaviour. But because we're coming from this belief system further down the line, we look at that and go, oh, that's insane. So we've got to be, I think, a bit more compassionate. Now, the people at a... Yeah, people at a uh, the next level up, a functional level, the difference is they may still be interested in telling you a lot about their symptoms, but they're interested in what you find. So they recognise that there's some dynamic to health and human function that you can tell about their body that they can't tell. So they will be, how was I today on a regular visit? Or they're interested in what their range of motion or what their x-rays show because they recognise that that tells them something that they didn't know based on how they feel. Now, um, so if first group's all about pain, this group's about prevention, and this is where this group, at one level, um, natural health practitioners will often go, well, prevention's fabulous, that's what I'm all about. But for many of us, we're not. We're actually interested in health a level above that, mm -hmm. because people at a prevention level, it's still really about how they feel, it's just doing, they're doing something so that they don't feel bad again in the future. Whereas I think what chiropractic is about and a lot of other healthcare practitioners are also focused on is that a level up higher than that, which is what I would call a lifestyle level of health awareness. And a lifestyle level of health awareness is really just where you recognise that how your body works influences everything you do 
But most critically, it influences the things that you love to do, you have to do, or you see as part of your role or your identity to do. So they recognise that there's this positive health, uh, this positive life impact of how your body is working rather than how your body working really just being, I don't want to feel bad in the future. Um, so that's kind of the levels of health awareness. And to me, the key to having a long-term thriving practice and to have the biggest, the best clinical results for people is to be using communication strategies to help people see their way up that, that spectrum. And I know we sort of started this conversation before we started recording in terms of retention and that ongoing relationship with people. Once people, if we look at that behavior follows beliefs idea, once you recognize that how your body works um, influences the things that you love to do, you have to do, or you see as part of your role or identity, it no longer becomes a cost. So people who are doing things for pain or prevention, they want to do as little of that as they possibly can because it's a cost. But once you're doing things that you can see are serving the things that are most important to you in your life, you're not looking to do them as little as possible. You're looking, you see them as an investment in what's important to you in your life. So from a, if we zoom out and look at, well, how do I make life easy in practice so that people just naturally want to be here and I'm not trying to convince them, I'm just presenting them options in terms of what might serve them. And we go back to that idea of influence versus uh, manipulation influencing people to realize a higher level of understanding about the significance of how your body works once they have that they own that belief then the natural behavior that runs with that is this is something that i want to do proactively on an ongoing basis yeah such a brilliant mm. framework and i can you know as you were going through that i look at back through past interactions where you know, there's been a level of frustration that I've had at communicating with someone who might be in a symptomatic, uh, you know, in that kind of, uh, on that part of the continuum. But then to kind of realize like each of these three groups, they have a different language. And you talked about all the, uh, you know, marketing messages that we're exposed to. And, you know, one, one of the, uh, the practice uh, magnifiers that we talk about early on there is is having uh, multipliers rather is having people understand that that we need to be communicated as though they're talking just to us uh, and yeah. and to just kind of differentiate that process there too is there Martin, is there a time frame that it takes if for somebody to get through that process you know from symptomatic through to lifestyle can it happen quickly in some people can what happen. Experience yeah. With that? So it's very, very variable. To me, it's like any other. If you think of any other continuum of belief, there's. If you think of the the beliefs that we could have in any area of our life, everybody's on an individual journey. And again, I guess sort of clicking on that idea of we're here to serve people, and that the only real change is going to come organically from them rather than us trying to impose it upon them or manipulate them. Mm. It. To me, it's really, there are people who are, I've been in practice for 26 years and there's people that I've seen over that 26 years who are still at a symptomatic level of health awareness. They come in for a few visits till they're feeling better and then they stop. And I'm going to, I'm happily here just asking the questions, giving them the experience that maybe one day they'll make that realisation. Mm -hmm. And there are other people who you can use a strategy like bridging, which I can share in a minute if you like, who... Mm -hmm it's almost like they transform overnight to do that. Um, and so I guess the, the the typical process that I would see is most practices don't have everybody who ever started care with them still in their practice. So we're all doing an incomplete job of if we see the behaviour that aligns with the belief system that we're hoping to represent as people doing something on an ongoing basis, not everybody just shifted to a different part of the state. Like some of those people just didn't get the big picture and aren't choosing to continue. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a long way of saying it's incredibly variable and it ranges. The smallest number of people would be people who it's an instantaneous thing, who go, oh, look, yeah, no, that makes 100% sense. And I would argue that the majority of people, if you explain different levels of a continuum with people, 
um, using, say, bridging, and they go, oh, well, that's me, they were probably already had that belief system. They just hadn't heard of chiropractic yet yeah. um, or, or whatever profession you're practicing. Um, the most common thing that I see is that people make that transition almost over the period of time that their care might take. So if we overlay on top of that continuum of care, for most people, the symptomatic phase of their care in a chiropractic context is going to be a six to 12 week kind of experience. And then there's a second phase where beyond just getting their symptoms under control, you're actually kind of restoring full function to their spine, nervous system, and the things connected to it in more of a restorative or reconstructive or any of the other names that are given there. And that's probably going to take a long, you know, it's measured in months most of the time. Like Let's say the remainder of a year mainly for an average adult. And so people in that first sort of phase of care, in a symptomatic phase of care, won't continue on to more of a restorative care unless they've made a transition to a functional or preventative level of health awareness. So it typically takes most people somewhere in that sort of six to 12 weeks to start to kind of, oh, yeah, I can sort of see the, the resonance of that. But then that next transition to go to a functional lifestyle sort of level of, oh, sorry, a lifestyle level of health awareness, which is really that transition from seeing the role of healthcare as being about prevention to seeing that it's about performance in an area of lifestyle value for them, then that's going to hopefully happen along that next few, that next period of months. Because if you have a preventative level of health awareness only, like you haven't got to that uh, level of um, having a performance oriented uh, level of health awareness, there's a thing that typically becomes a point of issue with things like chiropractic. Because if we look at things that people existing existing behaviours where they go to see a preventative healthcare provider, it's things like going to see a dentist, going to have a pap smear or a breast exam or a prostate exam or any of those sort of procedures. In terms of the frequency that those things are recommended to be done for people, you're typically looking at once a year, once every two years, or maybe if you had a super keen dentist every six months. Mm. So the when you translate that to chiropractors, then people will often be asking the question, so when do I get to start to stretch my visits out? Because chiropractors are typically recommending care in anywhere from once a week to once a month, I would say would be the, the most common things, which makes sense in a performance. It's a behavior that makes sense if you have a performance mindset, but it doesn't make a lot of sense preventatively because there's this mismatch and, mm. you know, I almost figure people are the gears in their mind are going, yeah, I kind of want my spine and nervous system to work well, but I don't get why they're so much more needy than my teeth. It's, it's, a, it's a miracle really that people transition along it at all. When you think about how strongly the culture is, certainly in that symptomatic and a little bit that, that preventative model, you know, our most, you know, uh, modern healthcare systems have positioned things like pap smears, breast exams, uh, you know, Ooh. these kind of things have positioned them as wellness when really what they are is early detection. And so there is yeah. that kind of confusion mm. there too. But I wonder also because they're probably, I, I'd like your thoughts on this because I don't know that somebody might always have only just a symptomatic belief. You know, I can see people inside that zone that then might choose to exercise every day that they can go, okay, I get why I do this, not necessarily. But can people have a little bit from each kind of yeah. one? Is that possible as well? Yeah, so like as a model, it's there are a lot of people who are just super consistent where if we look at exercise as an example, there will be people who will do exercise just because they've got pain yes. or a symptom. So yeah. that could be a symptom like, I'm so fat that I'm going to die of a heart attack or I'm so fat that I can't fit into my wedding suit. It's no. that real reactance. This is a problem. I'm doing this behavior to solve just this loud, ugly problem. And then there will be people who do exercise in just a preventative thing. I just exercise because I don't want to have heart disease and or I'm doing a rehab exercise to prevent my back pain coming back. Mm. And then there are people who adopt exercise as a performance thing. I do this because I'm more of who I am. I'm a better mother because if I get to exercise regularly, I, I think more clearly if I exercise regularly. So they're, they're fulfilling or 
uh, creating a high level of performance in an area of value for them by, by a behavior. So, and there are people, there are some people who are super consistent. Look, I've just got a, just a symptomatic thing. I'm never doing anything unless I absolutely have to. Uh, and then uh, there are people who are a little bit of a hodgepodge where they'll see self care in a preventative capacity. Uh, um, they'll see symptomatic, uh, they'll, they'll, deal with providers on a on a pain level so you're right there, there's differences but there it's unusual to have somebody who's at a performance level in terms of their self-care and uh, perform and, and not have a performance level in terms of taking look at working with providers as well got it got it got it so this concept of bridging martin what what do we what do we do? What can practitioners do to? And I'm assuming that that's taking someone from one to the next to the next, or late late yeah, so, on us. Okay, so if we look at permission, permission is the idea that it's a strategy that's based at telling people information, and where we need to be sensitive that this person might be at a symptomatic or preventative, and we're giving recommendations that might be higher than that, than where they're at, or there's this sense of a clash of beliefs. So if I and before I go into bridging, I can just give another example of where permission might work. If you, as a natural health practitioner, were taking care of a parent, and just coincidentally they had their baby with them when they came in, and they, they're just passing, they're having whatever service they're having with you, and then they said, oh, look, after this I've got to go to the GP because uh, Lockie's got an ear infection and, and we need to get some antibiotics. So if you just leap in and go... Okay, I'm not sure whether you knew this or not, but the American Academy of Pediatrics says that you should never be given an antibiotic to a child for an ear infection unless it's been there for 21 days, blah, 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 blah. And essentially what you're doing is you're making them wrong for their behaviour. And if we talk about emotional response, if you make somebody wrong for their decisions in an area that they are very see as part of their identity, I'm a mother, oh, you just opened up a whole can of reactants there they are just and confirmation bias and everything you have just there is no chance of you being able to navigate that they might have the social niceties of nodding and listening to you just because they the fury inside means that if they do say anything they're going to punch you um but don't think that you've actually changed anything by that direct and approach so you, you'd have to ask permission would it be okay if i offered you a different perspective now, if we then zoom out to bridging, the reason I wanted that beforehand is there's kind of like a, there's two perspectives to that idea of meeting people where they're at and talking, if a lot of the people who are coming to see us have some sort of symptomatic issue and are probably at a symptomatic level of health awareness. If we only talk to them about that early on in the relationship, isn't there a little bit of an implied lie about, well, actually my big vision for what I'd love for you in the future is this higher level of performance. So, uh, but if I just say to them, like my chiropractic asshole era of, chiropractic's not about how you feel, it's about you um, having your body working at its best so you can unfold your genetic potential, that's not a good strategy. Like it's making them wrong for what they are. And if you're at a symptomatic level of health awareness, that that looks like crazy fairy talk like it it sounds all rainbows and unicorns if i'm talking about that when you're like no no it's sore it's here it's here i don't need my genetic potential unfolded i need my my neck unkinked like mm. you, so th there's this balance of meeting people where they're at and also not omitting what the big picture is mm. but bridging is a way of taking people one step at a time so that they can see the links between it and see that it, it it's all uh, that that's a progression and that it's okay that they're doing what they do. So the way that this might work is once you've had a conversation with somebody, you've got what their priorities are, what their goals, what their aspirations were, what their problems are, then it would be using a strategy of communicating different levels of what you're about. So. The way that could work would be, so a lot of people come to see us, Tony, for exactly the issues that you're here. They've got neck pain, they've got back pain, they've got headaches, they've got challenges, and we've got a lot of experience with working with people like that. People typically get great results. There are also a lot of people who, once we've got things working better, recognise that before you had the pain, there was probably some things not working quite right in your spine or the related tissues, and that was there before the pain started, 
And so if we want to minimize the chance of the same sort of things coming back, it's going to be useful. And a lot of people do this where they work through kind of restoring as much function as we possibly can into those systems, into the spine and nervous system. So we minimize that we prevent as much as we can you being back in the same position. And then a big part of our practice is people have been through that process and then choose to come here regularly because they find that helping their body work better, helping their body proactively work better, not only helps minimize those problems coming back, but they often notice that other things are better. And so, for instance, with you, I know you're super into spending time with your family and you're big on lots of different types of exercise. Having a body that works better often means that you're better able to do those, do the exercise without um, having injuries. Your performance is sometimes is often better, but you've also got more energy and your mood's often better in terms of enjoying time with your kids. So big picture, that's kind of what chiropractic's about. Let's start here and see what serves you as we move along. Mm. Fair enough? Yeah. So that's bridging, bridging where you're not, you're not leaving out any part of the picture. You're not making it an and or. You're reinforcing um, the importance and the, of their autonomous ability to make decisions, but and you're piecing it together in a way that they can see, okay, that all kind of makes sense because it's not a radical departure. Mm. And, and, and coming from that first point of just not making them wrong, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty basic uh, yeah. basic starting point, isn't it? You know? yeah. Now, make them wrong. There was invitations through there, inviting them to that next stage and saying that this is what some people choose to do in our mm. practice as opposed to we this, make is what, them do this. this is what we're forcing mm. them. Because I think that level yeah. of autonomy from a practice member is important that I'm going to be playing an active role in all of this. I can start when I want. I can stop when I want. I can contribute uh, at whatever levels that I want to is important. You know, even if I want the whole enchilada, let me choose it as opposed to feeling mm. like I'm being kind of railroaded or manipulated down that direction there as well. So there's a word, Martin, that, that comes up, and we've had a, a chat about this previously in the word relevance. Uh, you know, a bit like you trying to sell me hair ties. doesn't matter how good your hair ties are. <laughs> it's just not relevant to me. Where does that, or, 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 where does or, that or, fit? Or, or, was there? How big a discount? It doesn't matter if I give you the best discount either. Yes. No. I don't want ribbons and bows. No. Where, does that, where does that fit in? Okay. So that, where it fits in is um, if we look at retention the, or, or whether people choose to have something, it's really a question of value. So if, we, if we're looking at value, uh, there's ideas around value that it's really important for us to understand. The filter before value is relevance. So relevance is, is this useful for me? So if somebody's coming in, if we double click on an idea we've already spoken about, if you if we talk about somebody coming in and the problem that they have is that they have a, a crick in their neck, the relevant at that time they're the pro, the thing that they're un, unfolding of their genetic potential is not relevant to them because they've got this problem that stands in the way. And if we go a layer deeper than the influence literature, there's this, this anthropology, anthropological idea that um, a lot of our behaviour is really driven by our genetic coding as hunter-gatherers. So if you look at your surviving as a soft, squishy human in an environment that's not all that uh, friendly, all the other animals have big claws and teeth and are physically stronger than us, and we're this kind of weak, slow, hairless ape. What we it, There's a couple of things to that. Partly it, it explains why we are so... Uh, we have such a strong reaction to being made wrong. It's disproportionate because we, if, if you're, you need to be, know that you have the ability to look after yourself, otherwise it's pretty dangerous. But we also tend to have a priority around dealing with problems way before looking to do things better. So um, the, the best, I guess, experience that I'd have is, let's say you're driving down a beautiful road, Great Ocean Road or uh, any of the other sort of coastal roads. You've got this beautiful vista around you. You've got trees. You've got the ocean there. You've got all these positive things that you could look at and it would enhance your well-being. But if you see flashing lights on the other side of the road, um, any sign of danger or problem, we are wired to straight away focus and the most important thing is the problem. So in terms of relevance, we've got to be relevant to where people are at 
to, to even earn their attention in the first place. So it's not that you only talk to people about problems, but be aware that Daniel Kahneman, who's you know, a pretty credible dude, he's a Nobel Prize winner, did a series of experiments where they show that this isn't like a subtle difference where we're more motivated away from what we don't want toward, than we are towards what we do want. It's like a 200% higher motivation. Mm. And it's not really a choice. It's how we're genetically wired. It's not like you can evolve beyond this idea. No matter what, if there's a problem that you see as, as stopping you doing stuff, that has to be sorted out before you have the option of then making things and making decisions in terms of moving towards what you do want. So that's one part of relevance. The second part of relevance is when we do look at those higher levels of health awareness, then the relevance there is uh, if we think of that idea of, you know, most people who've done any sort of marketing training will be relevant. Uh, re aware of the idea of features versus benefits. And so we're often in our healthcare practice trying to talk to people about it's really important that you keep this curve in your spine or we reduce your subluxations or get your whatever other levels are uh, in the right range. Nobody cares about subluxation. Nobody cares about having a proper cervical curve. Nobody cares about... You know, if you are, a, uh, you know, a nutritionist or a naturopath, nobody actually really cares about their omega-3 levels. They don't. What they care about and the relevance of that and therefore the value of it is what that allows them to do. Mm. In a pain context, having those things, if it helps me being less pain, I'm all for it. In a prevention capacity, if that helps me prevent being going back to where I was, I'm all for it. And in this performance capacity, if it helps me be better at the things that I value in my life, i.e. the things I love to do, the things that I have to do, or the things that I see as part of my role or identity, then I'm for it. But that's kind of the, the, the conversation around value. Beautiful. I think I've got it now. So what you're saying is on a windy day, the hair tie will keep the hair out of my face and allow me to focus on a target better. I think I've got it now, so you can sell me those hair ties anytime, Martin. I think, Martin, we, Angus, we're going to need a part two. Uh, we are going to need, we're going to need to dive so much more that you can deliver for our audience, yep. Martin. And I've got two asks of you. One, let, let our audience know where do people catch up with you? What's the best uh, way uh, to uh, find out more about Martin Harvey? So probably best thing is um, go to insideoutpractices.com. And we've got a newsletter there. I don't spam, I don't share the email list or anything like that, but pretty much week they'll get some cool information. Two main things that I do, one is uh, called Whiteboard Wednesday, where I'll break down some of these concepts that we've been talking about so that they can just have that regular dose of upgrading their communication. Um, if they go to the Insights tab on the website, They'll, they'll see that a bunch of them have been uploaded. So if this is stuff that resonates with them, they can have a whole lot of information. They can get a whole lot of training there. And, and I send out a newsletter each week with some information like that. More recently, I've also been doing a series called Under the Influence, which is where I interview people from around the world who are trying to make a change in the world and find out what works for them and what uh, excites them and the challenges and uh, journey that they've been on to make the impact that they have. So that would be the best way, insideoutpractices.com. Uh, lots of great stuff there. Excellent. We'll some links in the show notes about all indeed. that stuff there too. The second thing, the final thing that I'm going to ask you about is if you could go back in time, Martin, to when you first started practice and you yep. could only take one thing that you now know back yep. that's going to have a massive impact, what would that be as far as uh, knowledge of marketing or communication? Telling people doesn't change beliefs. Yeah. There you go. Beautiful way to sum up the last 45 minutes or so. Um, guys, dive into everything, everything Martin Harvey. Wonderful to have you on the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Uh, we look forward to part two down the track. Uh, 
Until next time. Until next time. We'll see you back on this same channel, whether you're watching us live on video, YouTube, or whatever the pipeline is that you like it. Martin, thanks for being so generous with your time today. And thank you for spending all the time gathering and pulling all this information together here too. So uh, be sure to check out Martin. His uh, content is, is brilliant. This is just a small taste of uh, just how wise he is as well. So until next time, Martin, Tone, thank you very much. Thank Gang, you. keep saving lives. We'll see you really soon. Over and out. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. See you, mate. Thanks.